Hello friends, welcome to our broadcast. I am Larry Hutton, this is Limitless Life. This is where we learn about true Jesus, true Word of God, true walk with God, where you, you can walk in health in your physical body, you can become financially free, you can become mentally and emotionally free and stable, you can live abundant life. That's the kind of real life that Jesus Christ came and, and wants us to have. It's not religion, folks, this is relationship. This is a relationship with a living person, his name is Jesus. His last name is not Christ, by the way. His name is Jesus. He, he is one with God. He is a wonderful Lord and Savior, and He wants you healthy and wealthy and wise and full of His peace and full of His joy and experiencing all uh, the good things that life brings so that you can actually enjoy life. You can actually have fun in life. Isn't that, isn't that a cool thing? Being a Christian and, and being able to be fun instead of a sourpuss or dull or boring. No, have fun. Have lots of fun. Boy, be so full of joy it bubbles over and you just want to dance. <laughs> you want to shout glory to God. He is so good. You know, I, I, I wish I'd have learned this a lot sooner than I did. When I finally learned that Jesus is a savior, he is a healer, he is a financier, he is a peace and joy giver. When I learned all those things, I thought, man, I sure wish I'd learned this sooner because I went for many, many years before uh, I learned about Jesus. I'd, I'd learned about religion, but it didn't set me free. But when I learned about truth, it made me free. Praise God. So thank you for joining us again. Those of you that join us every program, you know that uh, we get into the Word of God and we share things that are relevant for your life today. We've been actually doing a series that we're winding up on um, called God, Money, and Us. We always try and do teachings. What, what is relevant? What's something that I have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in my life? And so we're talking about money connected with God and us because God made money and it's something we use and it's something that God has a lot of wisdom concerning that we can apply to our lives so that it doesn't become our Lord. It doesn't become our master. God called money a master and he called himself a master. He said, uh, no man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, hold to the one, despise the other. You can't serve God and money. So God lets us know money's supposed to be our servant God, Jesus, is supposed to be our Lord and our Master. So we're going to uh, continue talking about this. We've actually been talking about our answering questions that people have written in or people have written down and given to me in meetings or people emailed in. But we've, uh, we've been answering questions on the subject of biblical prosperity or financial prosperity um, or money, whatever you want to talk. But, but it's, it's questions and answers on this particular subject that we're covering. Now, again, we've already been covering this for uh, 11, about to finish up. To next message will be 12 weeks, so three months of, of programs. So this is our 59th program. We've had 58 programs before this, so I would encourage you, if you haven't gotten to listen to them, man, get a hold of them. If you want to become financially free God's way, God's way is He, adds, he, he makes you rich, but He doesn't add trouble or sorrow with it. So you can actually have wealth and not all of the headaches and heartaches that go with wealth. Wow, that's awesome. So God, money, and us, this is the 59th uh, lesson, and uh, we're going to pick back up on these questions. Now, we've already covered 11 questions in the previous programs. Do we Here's questions that we've covered. Do we tithe on the net or the gross? What about a first fruits? Do I give a personal offering to a man of God calls first fruits? Uh, what about do we tithe on non-cash gifts? What about do we need to back tithe? If we just started tithing, do we need to back tithe? What about is tithing sowing? And that's important to understand because you're expecting harvest if it is sowing. Um, what about do I get a greater return by giving to prosperity preachers? Uh, another question, what do I do if I feel pressure or, or gimmicky stuff when, whenever there's an offering being received? What do I do? Next question that we covered, is it wrong to desire to be rich? Um, what, next question, if I pray when somebody's receiving an offering and if I pray and don't get an amount, what do I do? Um, uh, next question, how do I know who to partner with? And we covered that. Um, 
And then how much should my pastor get paid? How much should men and women that are in ministry full time get paid? And we covered that one. So uh, if you haven't gotten to listen to those, go back, listen to those, because those are things that people need to know so their hearts are right and so that you're not saying and spewing out of your mouth wrong things. All right, let's go on to some more questions that we've gotten. Thank you for the questions that have been given to me. Praise God. Here's another question. Since financial prosperity is a grace, then why do I have to do anything to be blessed? I had someone actually say that to me one time besides the question. I don't have to tithe or I don't have to give offerings for God to bless me financially. Well, of course, uh, we've already studied this out some, but let me just let me let me bring up some other points that will help you understand this question. Uh, what about forgiveness of sins? Um, what about living righteously? Yes, it's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So, so by grace you have become righteous, but do you need anything to, do you, have a, do you need to do anything to live righteously? Well, sure we do. We, we avoid going to strip clubs. Come on now, <laughs> whether it's men's or ladies, you know that's wrong. Uh, we, we avoid going to porn pornography shops or watching pornography on the Internet. That's wrong. So if you're going to live righteously, you're not going to you're going to do some things in the natural realm, right, to live righteously. Uh, we can't we cannot indulge in uh, human trafficking, which is going on today, uh, selling girls or selling kids for, for sex. So, yes, there are things that we have to do in the natural realm in order to live righteously. All right. Here's another question. What about health for the body? Do I need it? I mean, come on. It's grace that I'm healed. By grace, I'm healed. Just like by grace, I'm freed from sin. By grace, I'm healed. So do I need to do anything uh, in the natural realm concerning my physical body? Well, if that's... That's a no-brainer, but in case people haven't thought this out, think about different things that you could do to your body that could be bad. Let's think about food, for example. Food is fuel. Most people know that. It's fuel for the body, just like gasoline is fuel for the engine of a car. And if you put bad gas in a car, uh, the car's performance will be affected. It's going to be diminished. And if you put bad food in your body the performance of your body will be affected. Man, have I ever done that, man. So, you know, you eat donuts, bagels, chips, french fries, Oreo cookies. If you did that for every meal, are you going to tell me that it's not going to affect the health of your body? You're not very smart if, you're gonna, if you think you can eat donuts, bagels, chips, french fries, Oreo cookies for every meal uh, for the rest of your life and think it's not going to affect your health. You need to go study. Um, but obviously, there are things we have to do. So food is one of them for the natural body. Uh, you, you eat junk food all the time, you're going to have a junk health. <laughs> um, what about drinking water? People that don't drink water. 60 to 75 percent of the human body is made up of water. 90 percent of our blood is made up of water. Every organ, tissue, and cell in the body requires water for proper functioning. Symptoms of not drinking enough water can be feeling dizzy, getting lightheaded, uh, muscles feeling weak, back hurting, joints and muscles feeling stiff, constipation. So in other words, if we don't get enough water, what happens? Hmm. Don't get enough water? It sounds like you can uh, have some problems. <laughs> yeah, so there's things we have to do. What about exercise? So there's 650 skeletal muscles in the human body that help us and help different parts of the body move. In fact, there's over 800 muscles if you count the muscles that are inside the complex skeletal muscles. But what if we don't move those? That's why you see people as they get older, if they don't exercise, uh, that's why all of a sudden they have a hard time going up and down stairs or bending over or doing all these things because all of these 600 muscles that affect the different joints and stuff cause the joints not to work right if you're not exercising. Um, so if we don't exercise, we're going to have problems. So there's something you have to do. What about sleep? Humans can live longer without food than without sleep. Did you know that? It's clinically proven. Scientists <clears throat> said that staying awake 
for a consecutive amount of days, which is around 11 days, will actually cause death. See, sleep is when our minds uh, are restored and our bodies are restored and strengthen themselves and all that stuff. So, so if we don't sleep, there's something in the natural. You can't, if you don't sleep and you don't eat right, you don't exercise, you don't do these things, eat these things that we just mentioned, then you're not going to be physically healthy, even though you say, well, by grace, God's grace, I don't have to do anything. Oh, yes, you do. You have to take care of that body. You have to be a steward over that body. My point is, even though we are healed by grace through faith, there are things that we have to do in the natural realm in order for us to experience that grace. And likewise, we have to do something in the financial realm if we want financial grace to flow. Amen. We already found out in Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 29, that every aspect of the kingdom of God operates on seed time and harvest. So we have to do something in this natural realm. We have to sow money. And the only way it, money becomes seed is when you speak the word of God. We found that out. You have to put God's kingdom operates this way. He's the one that set it up. We already studied that out. If you, if you don't believe that, you need to go back because I didn't give my opinion. I showed you scripture after scripture after scripture how God's kingdom works. And we found out there's two, there's two money systems working in the earth. There's the world system We've, we studied the whole 73rd Psalm and found out the world system that a Christian and non-Christian alike can get rich apart from God's blessings. Just because you get rich doesn't mean it's God's blessing you. Now, if you're operating God's system of finance, fa faith through grace, <coughs> excuse me, I swallowed wrong. Uh, faith through grace and you're being a giver, generous giver, then it, all grace is going to abound to you. We've studied the scriptures, so you have to do something in order for grace to flow to you. Praise God. So, all these things answer that question. Since financial prosperity is grace, then why do I have to do anything uh, to be blessed? Why? Because the Word of God teaches us. It's the way God set things up. All right, so let's go on to the next question here. Uh, thank you for this question. This question is, boy, this is a humdinger of a question right here. Could get some people mad at me and everything else, but I, again, I'm just going to uh, share, share my heart with you and share scripture. Um, question, is all my tithe supposed to go to the local church and is there scripture to back that up? If so, then is there scripture to substantiate that my tithe goes to the local church? I've actually, because I teach on the subject of tithing and giving and financial freedom and all that, and been doing it for years, I've been asked this question numerous times. And more specifically, is tithing in the New Testament, which we've already covered a lot of, you know, or was it just under the law? Uh, we found out tithing is a New Testament doctrine and that we're supposed to tithe. Uh, but does my tithe belong to the local church? And, you know, most of us have heard Malachi 3, uh, 10, uh, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing, there's not room enough to receive it. And we've used that verse to teach that you tithe to your storehouse because the verse says, bring your tithes into the storehouse. And so the question becomes, is the local church in the New Testament, and that's the question that was asked, the storehouse that we are to bring our tithes. Well, um, we already found out that in Hebrews 7 that we tithe to Jesus. And of course, some people teach that, and they just teach that, and when they teach against tithing to the local church, they'll use Hebrews 7. But the, the Bible does say in Hebrews 7 that just like Abraham tithed to his high priest Melchizedek, you and me are supposed to tithe to our high priest, Jesus. So we know biblically that tithing is a New Testament doctrine under our covenant of grace. So that leads us to the second question then, where do we tithe under the new covenant and what scriptures tell us so? Um, I actually heard a reputable, reputable man of God say this, he, he made this statement. Don't get mad. Now, I'm just going to quote something that was said, and then we'll, we're going to discuss it, all right? So, but he said this, There is no New Testament scripture that calls the local church a storehouse or any other ministry a storehouse. You know, the apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist. 
So he says that there are, there's no New Testament scripture that calls the local church or any other ministry a storehouse. Neither is there any New Testament scripture that tells us where to tithe. Well, um, personally, <laughs> I'm going to give you my opinion here for a minute, okay? So personally, I believe the tithe goes to our local church. And I'm going to explain that in just why I believe that for, in just a minute. But on numerous occasions, I've had Christians uh, tell me that the Lord spoke to them to give their tithe somewhere else besides their local church. Now, now it wasn't on a regular basis. Uh, most of the time they said, no, we tithe to our local church. But there have been occasions where the Lord spoke and told us to give, somewhere, give our tithe to somewhere else. Well, now... I mean, if you tell me, I mean, you, you tell me that, who am I to say you did or did not hear from the Lord? I mean, especially since I don't have scripture to refute what you're saying. Come on now. Don't, don't get mad at me. Let's stay with the word here. If someone says, the Lord says, and then says that the Lord told me to do something and it doesn't line up with the word, then I have the right to say, now hold it, wait a minute, you're missing, you're missing it. That is not right. I have the right to say that. But if somebody says, tells me, well, they, God told me to tithe over here and I don't have one New Testament scripture that tells us where to tithe other than to Jesus, then I can't tell you not to do that or yes, that's right or no, that's wrong. I'd, I'd have to give you my opinion. Doctrine is always established on more than one verse of Scripture and New Testament doctrine is always established on New Testament Scriptures. So no matter what any man or woman, pastor or non-pastor, no matter what they say about where the New Testament Christians are supposed to tithe, they're giving their opinion. And we all have the right to do that as long as it doesn't contradict Scripture, right? So my opinion, Larry Hutton, my opinion is the tithe belongs to the local church, and here's why. Most of the letters written to the church in the New Testament are written to local churches. Even, even when Paul wrote to Timothy, he talked about the government of the local church. Um, in the book of Acts, it, it talks repeatedly of believers being part of a local church. And then in Jeremiah, if you read Jeremiah 3.15, Jeremiah prophesies about the future. And he says, I'm going to give you pastors according to my heart. And they're going to feed you with knowledge and understanding. Therefore, just from all of the scriptures that I read, now they're not talking about tithing, not talking about being the storehouse, but from all those scriptures, it seems like the local church appears to be the main place that you and I are going to be connected with for fellowship and community and, and, and being fed, then I believe that is where our tithes should go. And, and think about this. If all of a sudden you have to go to the hospital one night, you're going to have to go to the hospital, who are you going to call? You call, going to call up that famous television preacher? television evangelist, television pastor, television preacher, and they're going to come? No. No, you'll call your pastor. And if it's not a huge church, smaller churches, the pastor will go. Larger churches, they may have an associate pastor, but it's still going to represent the pastor. Who are you going to call? Right? What about somebody dies in your family and you need to do a funeral? Who are you going to call? You're going to call up the famous TV evangelist, the famous TV preacher, and they're going to come do the funeral? I think not. Not unless you happen to know him personally or something. No. What about when you do a wedding? Are you going to have your pastor do the wedding? Or are you going to have some TV preacher that you don't know? Are you going to call them up and have them come do it? They won't. Not because they don't want to. It's because they don't know you. It's, there's no connection there. And so over and over and over, who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? You're going to call your pastor. You're going to call the, the local church to help you out where you live. So, you know, again... Uh, I, I wish every Christian tithe, uh, right now I think the latest statistic was only 7% of Christians tithe. Is it any wonder why our churches don't have enough money? 
Wow. But, but there's a scripture too, and I know you pastors know this, Psalm 92, 13, those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. And so again, uh, you know, we ought, we, you and I ought to want to see our church family blessed. Uh, from the pastor right down to the most seemingly insignificant person in the church, we ought to want our churches thriving and prospering. And so, yes, tithe. But if, but if the Lord tells you to tithe somewhere else on occasion here and there, I'm sure not going to tell you the Lord didn't tell you because I don't have any scripture to tell you. So, praise the Lord. Let's go on. So, I hope, I, I hope I've helped you in that, just understanding. Um, here's the next question. Has there ever been a time when the Lord told you not to give in an offering? And my, question, my answer would be no. But there have been occasions when I've gone to church and not given. Um, God is never going to tell me to do something contrary. So when you ask me, has there been an occasion when he's told you not to give when I've gone to church? No, there's never an occasion when he's told me not to give. Uh, I'd got, I never got to church and, and all of a sudden heard the Lord say, now don't give in this offering. I never heard him say that. Uh, but there has been occasions when I've not given, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I've gone to, well, I'll, yeah, I'll go ahead and explain it. Um, I've gone to church, a, a church before. And they flat did not preach the word. Man, they preached man's opinion and man's theory and man's doctrine. The wisdom of men. No word at all. I didn't feel any responsibility because the Bible says, let him who is taught in the word communicate. So I'm supposed to be taught the word when I go. I, I had no responsibility, no obligation whatsoever, according to the scripture, to give in that offering. Now, if I go and I'm taught the word, then every time I'm taught the word, I don't care if last week I gave my tithe, this time, then I'm going to give something because I'm being taught the word. Let him who is taught the word give. Don't, don't muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. So I'm going to give every time I go to church if I'm taught the word. So just so you know, if you go to some church, some meeting, and they don't preach or teach the word of God, then you have no obligation, no responsibility to give. But otherwise, you give every time you go and taught the word. Here's the next question. Uh, God has put it on my heart to give to someone before and I didn't because of our relationship. I really care for them and didn't want to hurt their feelings, hurt their pride, hurt their dignity. Well, listen, if God tells you to give to someone and you don't give to them because you're afraid of their feelings, well, either they need to grow up or you do or something. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be mean here, but obviously if God puts it on your heart, please obey God. Isn't, isn't obeying God more important than obeying the person? Don't give to me because you're going to hurt my pride or dignity. No, bless God. Explain to them why you're doing it. Then they can take it up with God, right? And then they ask a second question. Also, things have been given to me and it was hard and still is to receive them. So in other words, some people have a hard time receiving when people want to give to them. Uh, I wondered, here's why they thought this. I wondered if I looked like or gave the impression that I was poor. So this Christian is asking this question. They think, well, if somebody's given to me, they must think I'm poor. And I don't want them to think that. Well, be careful here because you can get into pride here. Now, remember, we've already studied a lot of scriptures on this many weeks here. God may use somebody else to prosper you. It may be a harvest of some seeds you've sown, not because you're poor, but because God wants to bless a lot more than just what you need. All right. So, so. You've got to learn to receive just like you've got to learn to give. It's the law of giving and receiving, and it takes faith to receive that grace on both ends, the grace of giving and the grace of receiving. So that, and then your last part of that question to you, so should I give anonymously? Is anonymous giving better? And I've heard people ask that question. Uh, really, the only scripture that talks about anonymous giving is Matthew 6, uh, where in 6, 1, take heed, don't do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you don't have a reward and all that passage there. Well, if you actually look at that, uh, almsgiving is giving to the poor. And so uh, it's talking about when you give to the poor, don't broadcast and let everybody know what you're doing. Just do it anonymously. Liz and I did that one time. We uh, heard from the Lord about a, a pastor and his wife that were retired and they were on welfare and they were barely making it and they had this little shack. I mean, we heard so much bad stuff, it sounded terrible. And so we found out where they lived. We went up to this area up in North Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
and we went to where the address had been given us, and when we walked up, here was this little broken down fence and gate area, and I mean, a few chickens running around, and you walked in up to the door. This was a shack that looked like air would be blowing through it, and it looked terrible. I mean, just, oh, we felt so bad. And so we opened or, or knocked on the door, and here came this old elderly man and an old woman up to the door. And we said, Merry Christmas. The Lord sent us here to bless you. And they started crying, and both of them started lifting up their hands and thanking Jesus. And, oh, Jesus, you really do love us. And they started telling us their story that just a few days ago they had prayed and said, Lord, does anybody really love us? Is there anybody that really cares? Do you even know we exist, Lord? If so, send somebody. And God spoke to Larry and Liz Hutton, and thank God we heard. We just heard through the grapevine about them, but it was the Holy Ghost that led us at, because we heard, and we took them hundreds and hundreds. We wrote check for them, money, gave them money. We bought them groceries from Walmart and bought them a bunch of household stuff from Walmart. Gave them hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. And they gave God the glory. So, man, we, we have to... Uh, give and give anonymously. We didn't tell anybody. But on the other hand, when Jesus was watching the rich throw into the treasury and the widow woman throw in, he didn't rebuke their giving and everybody saw what they were giving. So only giving to the poor is when the scripture talks about giving anonymously. It doesn't hurt if people see what you're giving in other areas. All right, we're out of time, so we're going to have to pick up. We do have one more program that I want to get through the rest of these questions. So thank you, partners, for supporting our ministry. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for helping us get this Word of God out and share these programs with other people as well. We love you. We'll see you next program. In his book, God, the Gold, and the Glory, Larry Hutton delivers a powerful and insightful message which helps tear down some long-standing religious traditions about money and riches that are plainly untrue when seen in the light of the Bible. This book reveals the truth in God's Word concerning godly believers having and using the world's riches, just like Abraham, Joseph, and Jesus used them. You will learn the ways that God prospers His people and see the reasons why God delights so greatly in blessing His people with prosperity. God is glorified when His children prosper and when they have learned what to do with the riches He has given to them. To order God the gold and the glory, go to LarryHutton.org or call 888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton, where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others. You'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org, or you can call 888-887-WORD.